I'm being a good father is important to me. And so between the Eagles, Eagles and my kids and my charitable endeavors. Don Henley, the legendary frontman of the Eagles, is considered one of the richest drummers in music history. Recently, at the age of 77, Henley admitted about a special woman who captured his heart and had a profound impact on his career. Who is that special woman? Stay tuned for the answer. Donald Hugh Henley, known as the Prince Charming of the 70s, is not only a famous musician, but also one of the founding members of the rock band Eagles. He is considered one of the most successful musicians in history, with an estimated net worth of over $250 million and multiple Grammy awards during his career. However, Henley's love life has not been as smooth as his career. Despite being a charming star, Henley's love relationships have often encountered many troubles and scandals. It is known that he has had more than 17 relationships with different female stars, but most of them did not have a good ending. Among his love affairs, there is one outstanding relationship that has overcome all challenges and become special in Henley's life. This love affair has contributed to shaping the person and artist he has become, showing that even big stars face difficulties in love. Don Henley's true love was a big part of his life. But what made Henley such a standout, attracting not only female stars, but also millions of fans? Born in Gilmer, Texas, and raised in the small town of Linden, Northeast Texas, Henley had humble beginnings. While attending Lyndon Kildare High School, Henley initially played football. However, due to his small stature, his coach advised him to change direction. From there, Henley joined the school band, where he started playing trombone before switching to percussion. This was when he began pursuing his passion for music. Henley joined a Dixieland band that his childhood friend Elmer Bowden formed with Jerry Surratt. The band was originally called The Four Speeds, then changed to Felicity in 1964 and went through several lineup changes. As Felicity, they signed with a local producer and released the song Hurtin', which Henley wrote. After graduating from high school in 1965, Henley attended Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, but transferred to North Texas State University in Denton from 1967 to 1969. He took a break from school to care for his father, who was seriously ill. In 1969, Felicity met Kenny Rogers, who took an interest in them. They changed their name to Shiloh and recorded several songs, including Jennifer and Oh My Lady, their first single. Unfortunately, childhood friend and bandmate Surratt died in a mountain bike accident shortly before Shiloh's single was released. The group continued with Don Henley, Richard Bowden, and Henley's cousins, Michael Bowden, Al Perkins, and Jim Ed Norman. Kenny Rogers helped sign the group to Amos Records and brought them to Los Angeles in June 1970. At Larrabee Studios, they recorded an album titled Shiloh, produced by Rogers, during which they lived at his house for several months. However, in 1971, Shiloh disbanded due to differences in leadership and creative styles between Henley and Bowden. In Los Angeles, Henley met Glenn Frey, who was also signed to the same record label. The two were soon recruited by John Boylan to be Linda Ronstadt's backing band on tour in 1971. This tour was the catalyst for Henley and Frey to form their band. They invited Randy Meisner and Bernie Leiden, who had also played in Ronstadt's backing band, to join them. And so, the Eagles, one of the greatest bands of all time, were born. They shaped Don Henley's image and had a remarkable success, with the Eagles' story being written through inspirational melodies and great success. Formed in 1971, the Eagles quickly became one of the most influential bands in American music history. The easy listening California sound they developed in the 1970s continues to resonate on classic rock radio and has redefined many rock artists, especially in modern country music. Since their debut, the Eagles have sold over 150 million albums worldwide, won multiple Grammy awards, and had a string of hit singles, with five number one singles and 17 top 40 singles. And that's not all. In 1988, the Eagles were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, becoming the best-selling American band in history. But their story is much more than just the surface success. Signed to David Geffen's Asylum Records, the band, consisting of Glenn Frey, vocalist-guitarist, Don Henley, vocalist-drummer, Bernie Leiden, guitarist, and Randy Meisner, bassist, released their debut album, Eagles, in 1972. The album featured songs like Take It Easy and Witchy Woman. 
Woman, which combined elements of rock and roll with country and folk influences. Before the Eagles, country rock had become a movement in Los Angeles in the late 1960s. Their music provided a platform for millions of young rock fans in the 1970s who sought something new while still holding on to nostalgia for classic rock and traditional Americana. The band continued to expand their sound with 1973's Desperado, even featuring cowboys on the album cover, which was photographed by Henry Diltz. 1974's On the Border gave them their first number one hit, Best of My Love, and also welcomed guitarist Don Felder. With the release of One of These Nights in 1975, Don Felder officially became a member of the Eagles. However, Bernie Leadon began to feel frustrated as the band moved away from country and folk music to a more aggressive rock sound. After the album's tour, Leadon left the group and was replaced by Joe Walsh, formerly of the James Gang, who brought his unique guitar style with him. In 1976, the Eagles reached their commercial peak with the compilation Their Greatest Hits becoming a must-have. In recognition of the album's success, the RIAA created a platinum status for selling 1 million copies. With Walsh and Felder on board, the band began recording the best-selling album of their career, Hotel California, released in late 1976. Hotel California is not just an album, it is a landmark in music history. The Eagles' songwriting, especially Don Henley and Glenn Frey, produced a distinctive sound with a more aggressive rock sound and progressive rhythms than many other country producers. Henley described the songwriting process for Hotel California as starting with a guitar idea Felder had, which led to a song that became the band's signature track with its climactic guitar solos between Walsh and Felder. Felder sent Henley a cassette tape of various musical ideas, but only one song caught Henley's interest, and he recognized its potential. This was the beginning of one of the most famous songs in rock history. The Eagles, on the other hand, were progressively falling apart at the seams, despite the overwhelming success of their album Hotel California, which was released in 1976, and the accompanying tour that followed. When you learn that the band is likewise well known for its hits, you will be surprised to learn that it is also well known for the internal strife and personnel changes that it has experienced. The strong-willed leaders of the band, Henley and Frey, were responsible for writing the majority of the band's songs, occasionally in collaboration with other songwriters like J.D. Souther and Jackson Brown. This served to anchor the other members of the band. After an incident with Frey in 1977, bassist Meisner left the band because he was fatigued and refused to perform his song, Take It to the Limit. Frey was upset with Meisner because he refused to perform his song. Meisner was replaced by Timothy Schmidt, and the band went into the studio to record what would turn out to be the final album that the Eagles would release during their time in the 1970s. The album, titled 1979 The Long Run, was completed after a period of 18 months. There was an initial plan for it to be a double album, but the members of the band were unable to come up with enough songs to make it happen. However, despite the fact that it was a big economic success, it was considered a letdown by several critics since it did not meet the standard set by Hotel California. A total of 7 million copies of the album were sold, and it topped the charts. Additionally, it included three songs that reached the top 10. The 10th of November 1979 saw the release of their final song, Heartache Tonight, which topped the Hot 100 chart. The song, I Can't Tell You Why, and the title tune both made it to number 8 on the charts. For their song, Heartache Tonight, the band was awarded their fourth Grammy. During their time on stage, In the City by Walsh and the Sad Cafe became favorites. The band also recorded two Christmas songs during these sessions, Funky New Year and Please Come Home for Christmas. Both of these songs were released as singles in 1978 and reached number 18 on the charts. Funky New Year was initially released in 1978. Look What You've Done to Me was a single that was released by Boz Skaggs, and Frey, Henley, and Schmidt all provided backup vocals to the song. The Long Night at Wrong Beach is a term that has been used to characterize the event that occurred on July 31st, 1980 in Long Beach, California, when tempers reached a boiling point. Felder, who was still smarting over the duo's decision to delete his vocal from Victim of Love on Hotel California and replace it with Henley's, objected to the band attending a political fundraiser for Democratic California Senator Alan Cranston. This was the moment that the band's long simmering tensions finally reached a boiling point. During the performance that took place in Long Beach, Felder and Frey made threats against one another while they were performing on stage. 
With her excellent documentary History of the Eagles, which was released in 2013, Allison Elwood catches the audio of the combat as well as the aftermath. Once again, the Eagles had performed their final concert. It seemed as though the band had finally achieved its conclusion, and from that point on, there would be no further communication from the Eagles. However, for Don Henley, this was a moment of departure, or beginning. On his own, he would be able to succeed. When it came to the legacy of Don Henley, he was not going to let the bad blood that existed among the band members bury his aspirations. When Henley was working as a solo artist, he was able to sell more than 10 million albums all over the globe, create 8 songs that made it into the top 40, and win 2 Grammy Awards and 5 MTV Video Music Awards. Rolling Stone Magazine ranked him as the 87th greatest vocalist of all time, while Music Radar ranked him as one of the finest singing drummers of all time. Both of these accolades were bestowed upon him independently. During the East Texas Music Awards ceremony that took place in 2015, Henley was also presented with the Lifetime Achievement Award. His solo career, which took his ability to a bigger limelight, began in the 1980s as an increasingly delicate singer-songwriter. By the early 2000s, he had grown into a famous artist. His solo work led him to greater attention. Stevie Nicks had written the song Leather and Lace for Waylon Jennings and his wife Jessie Coulter before the end of 1982. Don Henley and Stevie Nicks collaborated on the song, which went on to become a top 10 pop and adult contemporary success. I Can't Stand Still, Henley's debut solo album was a somewhat successful sales accomplishment. A gold certification was awarded to the track Dirty Laundry for sales of more than 1 million copies in the United States. This achievement occurred at the beginning of 1983 when the record reached number 3 on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. The record was not only nominated for a Grammy Award but also turned out to be Henley's most successful solo single of all time. Additionally, Henley contributed Love Rules to the soundtrack of the film Fast Times at Ridgemont High which was released in 1982. Construction of the Perfect Beast was the album that came after this one in the year 1984. In the same way that the Eagles had done in the 1970s, Henley connected creatively with his era by focusing on electropop on the Boys of Summer Smash album that was released in 1984. In terms of the Billboard Hot 100, the track peaked at position number 5. Jean-Baptiste Mondino was the director of the music video for the song, which went on to win many MTV Video Music Awards, including the award for Best Video of the Year. Additionally, Henley was awarded the Grammy for Best Male Rock Vocal Performance for his performance of the song. In addition, other tracks on the album such as All She Wants To Do Is Dance, which reached its highest position on the Hot 100 chart at number 9, Not Enough Love In The World, which reached number 34, and Sunset Grill, which reached number 22, received a significant amount of radio. The song Who Owns This Place, which was included on the soundtrack for the film Color Of Money, went on to become his third album rock chart smash. Henley's subsequent album The End Of The Innocence, which was released in 1989, had even more popularity. The title tune of the album, which was the result of a collaboration with Bruce Hornsby, peaked at number 8 on the singles chart. Songs such as The Heart of the Matter, The Last Worthless Evening, and New York Minute were among those that received playing on the radio. And to reiterate, Henley was awarded the Grammy for Best Male Rock Vocal Performance in 1990 for his work on the album The End of the Innocence. In the same year, 1990, he also appeared in a single episode of the Unplugged series on MTV. Near the middle of the 1990s, Henley released the single The Garden of Allah to promote his most successful solo album, Actual Miles, which contained all of Henley's most successful songs. It was about this time that the Eagles made their comeback, which put a shadow on Henley's career, which was experiencing great success. Additionally, during this period, the legal dispute that Don Henley had been engaged in with Geffen Records for some years became well known to the general public. In his attempt to get out of his contract, Henley cited a California legislation that was 50 years old and limited the length of entertainment contracts to 7 years. He desired to enter into a publishing contract with EMI that would be more profitable. In response, Geffen Geffen Records filed a breach of contract lawsuit against Henley, claiming that he owed them two studio albums and a greatest hits compilation. The lawsuit was filed for $30 million. 
million. The disagreement was settled when the Eagles got back together and Geffen took a sizable portion of the revenues from the record that was released during their reunion. Everyone had believed that the Eagles band had been gone for a very long time, so the announcement of their reunion produced a lot of fanfare. In 1994, it had been 14 years since they had broken up. What were their plans for getting back up again? Despite the possibility of being regarded as a washed-up group by the ever-changing palette of the music business, Frey, Henley, Walsh, Felder, and Schmidt got back together for the live album Hell Freezes Over, which was released in 1994. The album was given this name because the band had sworn that they would never get back together again until Hell Freezes Over. Following the publication of the record, the Eagles also embarked on a tour that turned out to be quite successful. The reunion tour and record of the band, which contained four new songs, and was even more popular than the previous one, was tinted with nostalgia but yet maintained a strong musical energy. As a result of the band's tremendous success with both the record and the tour, they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in the year 1998 and played with Meisner and Leiden, who had previously been members of the band. The band did not have a breakthrough as a result of this, which is unfortunate due to the fact that they were the Eagles. Drama ensued not long after. Following the events that transpired, Henley proceeded to to release his solo efforts. The new singles, Taking You Home, Everything Is Different Now, Working It, and For My Wedding were included on his solo album, which was named Inside Job and reached its highest position on the Billboard 200 chart at number 7. In the year 2001, Felder was not retained by the Eagles. Subsequently, he filed a lawsuit against the band, alleging that they had unlawfully terminated his employment. There was yet a chance of success. In 2007, the band got back together for a second time. As a result of Felder's departure, the the band continued to function with its four original members. In the same year, they released Long Road Out of Eden, a double album that was the Eagles' first collection of wholly new songs in over three decades. The record was a double album. In addition to being a success with fans and critics alike, the album also marked the beginning of the band's departure from the conventional paradigm of production and distribution that is used in the business. Additionally, the Eagles' official website and Walmart stores were the only places where the North American version of the album Album could be purchased. The album was released under the Eagles Recording Company label, which is owned by the band. The song, I Dreamed There Was No War, which was featured on the album Long Road Out of Eden, was awarded the Grammy Award for Best Pop Instrumental Performance in the year 2009. 2013 saw the publication of the band's documentary History of the Eagles, which was split into two parts. During the time that Henley was not working on a new recording, he collaborated with a wide variety of artists and projects. Some of the artists he collaborated with include Patti Smith, Trisha Yearwood, and Roger Waters. He also participated in duets with Kenny Rogers and Reba McIntyre, Ronnie Dunn, and Alison Krauss. In addition, the Eagles band continued to travel on a consistent basis, boasting unwavering vitality and success, up until the point where Frey became unwell. Sadly, he passed away in the year 2016 when he was 67 years old. Despite the fact that Frey's son Deacon and country singer guitarist Vince Gill joined the Eagles, it appeared that the Eagles had reached its conclusion for yet another time. Despite the fact that the Eagles' history will live on forever, the band continues to perform while on the road, since they are now on their lengthy farewell tour. To long last, we have arrived at the benefit of watching this film. According to Don Henley, the affairs that took place behind the scenes were not much better than the turbulent and dramatic past of the Eagles. Life outside of work for Don Henley, particularly noteworthy, is the fact that Don Henley has had a colorfully passionate dating history with wonderful ladies who come from a variety of backgrounds in the fields of entertainment, fashion, and philanthropy. While he was pursuing his music career, most of his romantic relationships occurred simultaneously. These partnerships were reflective of some of the individuals he encountered while working in the music industry. He had a connection with Lori Rodkin, an American jewelry designer and philanthropist, which was one of the most renowned partnerships they had. Rodkin is well known for her namesake luxury jewelry company, which has even been published in magazines such as Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. The season of fall 1974 marked the beginning of Don Henley's relationship with the gorgeous Lori Rodkin, who was 22 years old at the time. This was the beginning of the path that led to Hotel California. 
An extremely taxing split with actress Susanna Martin, which largely inspired The Best of My Love, occurred not long after Henley met Rodkin and fell deeply in love with him. Rodkin first refused to go out with him, but Henley eventually broke up with him. The failed engagement that Rodkin had with Bernie Topin, who was Elton John's songwriting collaborator, was still causing her to feel a great deal of emotional distress. At the time when she ultimately gave in and started seeing Henley, she had no idea what instrument he played. He offered her a collection of his records with great patience. Not too much longer after that, they were purchasing bedding and pillows and putting together a house in Malibu collectively. However, Henley encountered a number of challenges when he moved into a domestic relationship with a woman for the very first time. One of the issues was that he continued to show an excessive amount of interest in pursuing other women. A night out on the town was something that Henley and his friend and partner J.D. Souther enjoyed doing on a regular basis. They did this many times a week. They were aware that they were pursuing two of the most accomplished accomplished and attractive guys in Hollywood, and they were pursuing both of them. In the beginning, Rodkin was able to bear Henley's behavior to the extent that he rationalized it by considering it to be a vital component of his creative process. Several times, a female that one of us had gone out with would prefer to believe that the songs that we had written were about her. Henley even confessed that this was the case. It is a compilation of all of the tracks. Any of my songs have elements of every female that I have ever been with. Like fictional characters, they are combinations of characters. However, certain elements of Hotel California are directed against Lori Rodkin that are considered to be more offensive. Her thoughts are warped like Tiffany's. A Mercedes-Benz was purchased by her. In her circle of friends, she has a large number of attractive young men. She is the subject of it, and if I were Ms. Rodkin, I wouldn't be crowing about it. I consider her to be the Norma Desmond of her generation. I believe that she is. When Rodkin ultimately abandoned him, Henley delayed about a month before contacting her. Henley cited his excitement over a new song he had written called Wasted Time as the reason for his delay in getting in touch with her. It appears that Rodkin was not amused by the situation. Henley stated that it was a song written as a type of farewell. After that, he revealed to her that the true reason he had phoned was because he desired to reunite with her from the past. As Rodkin put it, it is not feasible. In the meantime, she was already connected with Bernie Topin, who had been her ex-fiancé. Soon after, Henley went on to other things. Late in 1975, he began a relationship with Stevie Nicks, a member of Fleetwood Mac, which was a relationship that garnered a lot of attention. Even though they had never met or spoken to one other before, Henley decided to pick up the phone and contact Nick one night. Henley had been a fan of Nicks for a long time and was aware of the battle between the two bands for the title of best-selling album of the year. The two struck up a conversation, which led to a string of passionate phone calls between them. During these discussions, they shared their feelings about the isolation that comes with living the life of a long-distance rock star. In Nix, who had only lately ended his relationship with Lindsey Buckingham, Henley discovered a sympathetic soul. Henley was still full of Rodkin. Nix questioned Henley about how much more troublesome it was for her to have to perform with him every night. Eventually, both ensembles were scheduled to perform in the same cities. Mick Fleetwood, John McVie, and Christine McVie of the Mac came up with the idea to play a prank on Nix since they were aware that Henley was going to make an appearance backstage at some point during the performances. The Best of My Love Tonight Dawn was written on a card that was signed by Henley and included in the bouquet that they delivered to her. Up to the point where he was able to persuade her that he had nothing to do with the hoax, Nix was extremely upset and enraged by what she saw to be Henley's arrogance. The two then had a serious romance that lasted for two years. The way Nix recalled it was as follows. After Lindsay and I broke up after the rumors episode, I began dating Dawn. He was exquisite and he was quite cute at the same time. He instructed me on how to handle my finances. Clearly he did not intend to carry out that action. Simply put, I observed him. To give you an example, he was fine with the idea of purchasing a property just like that or sending a Learjet to pick you up. In the end, Nix became pregnant and neither of them had any doubts that Henley was the father of the child. The problem that would have arisen as a consequence was swiftly and discreetly rectified when Nix, amid his tour dates, decided to get an abortion. She was quite outraged over what she believed to be his quick and easy assent to her decision according to friends, even though Henley did not make any attempt to force the issue against her. 
Nix interpreted it as Henley's way of indicating that he was not interested in making any kind of significant commitment for an extended period. And in the beginning, Henley played the role of the ideal Southern charm gentleman, as had become his pattern from the outset. Lear jets to Paris for romantic meals, flowers, phone calls, and words of love are all examples of romance. In the end, he was aloof, unapproachable, moody, argumentative, and evasive. He distanced himself from others. It had been a running joke among the Eagles crew since they had gotten so accustomed to the routine by this point. Love and Lyrem was the name given to Henley's preferred tactic of seduction later on in his career. After some years had passed, Henley expressed his thoughts about his affair with Nick. He stated that Nix had given the name Sarah to the unborn child before the abortion that she underwent. According to Henley, she then went on to write the song with the same name, which went on to become a great hit for her. She reportedly dedicated the song to the soul of the baby that had been aborted. Over almost two years, they had a relationship that was always on and off. After that, Henley started a relationship with Lois Chiles, an actress, model, and Bond girl, which lasted for a period of three years. Chiles stated to the Houston Chronicle that despite the fact that they loved each other, the relationship simply was not meant to be forever, and it ended after three years of being together. Chiles stated that despite the fact that we loved one other very, very much, the relationship was not working out. Those are the kinds of things that happen. I couldn't be the person he needed me to be, and he couldn't be the person I needed him to to be by the same token. Even though we had a great deal of love and respect for one another, it was a challenging situation. At the beginning of the 1980s, Henley was engaged to Marin Jensen, who had previously appeared on Battlestar Galactica. Jensen, who also contributed harmony vocals to the song Johnny Can't Read, was honored with a dedication on his debut solo album, which was titled I Can't Stand Still. The music video for Henley's song Not Enough Love in the World was released in 1985, and Jensen was featured in it. Jensen continued continues to assist her ex-boyfriend in establishing a charitable organization known as the Walden Woods Project in the early 1990s, even though they had been engaged at the time of their breakup in 1986. Before Henley met the woman who would become the love of his life, his wife Sharon Summerall, this was the final serious relationship that Henley had before he met his husband. When Henley first met Sharon Summerall in 1993, he knew that he had at long last found the person he was meant to be with and that he was finally prepared to start a family. There are sometimes unexpected turns and twists in love stories before they reach their happy conclusion. It took Don Henley a few attempts before he was able to find the person he would spend the rest of his life with. Model Sharon Summerall, who is also a native Texan, completely won his affection. Bruce Springsteen, Sting, Billy Joel, John Fogarty, Jackson Brown, Sheryl Crow, Glenn Frey, and Tony Bennett were among the celebrities who arrived to witness the couple's wedding in 1995. The ceremony was attended by a large number of celebrities. The wedding was even referred to be a rock and roll hall of fame by one of the guests that attended. In 1995, Henley tied the knot with Sharon Summerall, a distinguished socialite and model. Subsequently, he composed the song Everything Is Different Now from the album Inside Job Just For Her. A wonderful lady with her own narrative, Sharon Summerall is not only the wife of the famed singer, but she is also a remarkable woman. Summerall is a legend in her own way, from the early days of her career as a model to the more personal hardship she has faced in her family life. When Summerall was in her early 20s, she entered the world of modeling, which is quite glamorous. The outstanding beauty and self-assurance that she had led to her being hired by prestigious modeling agencies such as Ford Models, Eva Models, and Elite. Because of her talent, she was able to walk the runways of New York City, Paris, and Milan, among other international cities. Despite this, fate had other things in store for her. Sharon was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in the early 1990s, just as her career was beginning to go in the right direction. Multiple sclerosis is a hard condition that affects the nervous system, and for Summerall, it meant that she had to put her aspirations of being a model on hold. However, despite everything that has happened, Henley has shown to be a devoted husband to his wife for over 28 years. She is coping well, and she is holding her own. In 2008, Henley stated to the Mirror that she had both healthy and unhealthy periods. Sharon 
Karen is fortunate to have the remitting variety of multiple sclerosis, which gives her optimism that she may experience better days in the future. Annabelle, Julia, and Will are the three children that Henley and Summerall are ecstatic to have as their children. To provide their children with a more realistic upbringing, the couple decided to relocate to Texas to raise their children away from the glare of Hollywood. In an interview with The Mirror, Henley previously stated, I wanted my children to have an upbringing that was comparable to mine, and family is our top priority. In addition, the fact that my wife's parents are also very much interested makes it much simpler to accomplish here, Henley said. Henley, who is now 77 years old and has outgrown his young vitality and star glitter, is a parent who wants to be a good example for his children and teach them a lesson from his experiences. What is your favorite Don Henley song? And what do you think about this artist? When did his life go through so many love affairs? Please share your thoughts in the comments section below. We would love to hear from you. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more interesting updates. Thank you and see you in the next video.